You think if I turn it off, it'll turn back on? Yep. That's, is that, wow. All the way to the f***ing hell. Oh my god, that clutch is like a rock. This is actually first right there. So where's third? How do you shift beside this thing? You don't. <laughs> this thing is completely the time circuit's in the way. I can't drive with it with the time circuit in the way. Oh, okay. So it's, there's about two inches of nothing going on there, and then it's the gas. That's it. So if you don't know, it may look like a DeLorean, it may look like a time machine, but in fact, this is not a time machine. Behind me, there is a Volkswagen Beetle engine because this thing is in fact a dune buggy. In here, you have a roll bar, which no DeLorean has ever had a roll bar. This thing has a roll bar because the bottom is modified. So everything's been modified and it is a manual transmission, however vague and how much of a guess it is, there's first gear. But it drives like a dune buggy. I'm assuming it drives like a dune buggy, and we're gonna see if it does, how it is. Okay, nope, there it is. Mm. When the hammer went down, I now have the notoriety of having paid the most money ever for a DeLorean motor car. Sorry, you're saying that you, are, you have paid the most money anyone has ever paid for a DeLorean? Absolutely. How much? Well, it's $541,000 for this car. There were seven DeLoreans used for the three movies. There are three that remain. The one that is in Universal Studios in Florida, the one that's in California, and the one sitting in my barn in North Central Massachusetts. This is the only screen-used DeLorean time machine in private hands. I've been collecting automobiles and automobile memorabilia since I was a kid. In the 50s, when somebody had a paper route, I had three paper routes. I loved the idea of having money in my pocket, and I was always a bit of an entrepreneur. And I loved World War II memorabilia, and I always had the philosophy, if I can buy two, and sell one for what I paid for the two and keep one, my collection cost me nothing. So that has allowed me to have the comfort of uh, buying automobiles that I've enjoyed. So I've always managed to uh, live beyond my means in terms of, uh, of cars. I'd buy more, but I like being married. 1967, uh, my son Patrick came along. Patrick's DNA is obviously uh, the same. Patrick now uh, works with me on a daily basis. Uh, many a day, uh, we'll find Patrick down here in one of the barns working on one of the cars because we have an event or uh, an appearance that we need to make. He also knows if we press a button and something doesn't work, he knows how to make it work. <laughs> I didn't pursue the DeLorean until the early 90s. At the price point, which is I think $10,000, I decided to add it to the uh, fleet of cars that I had at the time. I instantaneously realized that I had a winner on my hand because when I would take it to the cruising nights, people would make the joke, where's the time circuits, uh, where's Marty, you know, uh, where's the cocaine? I said, how do we go about uh, finding something that would resemble a flux capacitor? And I was like, Dad, you're not gonna believe this. You know, you can buy a flux capacitor. And he said, let's buy it. Once you do that, there is no going back. Maybe we could take our DeLorean and turn it into a time machine. And it was a killer hit. Today is a big day for fans of Back to the Future, the movies. Today is October 21st, 2015. It is the date uh, to which Marty McFly and Doc Brown travel in Back to the Future 2. The future. 
we sent it off for some mechanical work. And uh, it was about a year and a half. Well, in between time, I started Jonesing. I really missed my car. So Patrick said, why don't you buy another one, Dad? Sometime in the fall of uh, 2011, uh, we were made aware uh, that this car would be coming up to auction. I thought, there's no way. There's just no way because it's gonna be way too much money. We're gonna have competition overseas. Jerry Seinfeld, endless money. And if they want something, people like us are never ever gonna be able to get it. But man, wouldn't that be cool? I sent Patrick out to uh, California. And of course I was just chomping at the bit. I had to get in there and see that car. And he opened the garage door and it was like, uh, there it was. And immediately I said, you know, if it was up to me, I don't care how much this car costs, we have to have this car. Uh, it was December uh, 2011. My parents were on vacation, uh, but my father literally left vacation early to come to the auction of Beverly Hills. I told him it's everything that you think it's gonna be. And the day came and it was the Paley Center in Beverly Hills. You know, dad had said, I've got a limit. He goes, I can't spend whatever on this. I've got a limit, but there's a chance, you know, like uh, uh, Jim Carrey said, dumb and dumb. So what you're saying is there's a chance. Right? <laughs> So there we were, sitting in the audience and looking around, seeing who was there. And really, as the momentum built up and as it got to that particular lot, you know, I was shaking in my boots. Time came for the DeLorean to come up for sale, and uh, uh, the opening bid was four hundred thousand dollars. That was my father's bid, four hundred thousand. Then four twenty got bid, and he's looking for four forty. I looked over at Dad, and he just went. He said, okay, I have 440 here, and it seemed like it was at least 10 minutes went by. I remember sitting there going, sell it, sell it, sell it, sell it. As soon as the gavel fell, I literally jumped out of my seat. You know, Dad and I had a, a nice uh, man hug. It was a wonderful, tremendously exciting moment. Uh, I, I, we had to do nothing to it except get it running. It wasn't running very well or at all. Matter of fact, it wouldn't start. It was explained to me that it did not run well before I bought it. I might have left that out when I told my father about it, though. I don't know when it's on, when it's off. Just a little bit of uh, fine tuning to that Volkswagen engine, and uh, it starts and it uh, started and it ran very well, and it still runs very well. There you go. There it yeah. is. Okay. All right. First gear is somewhere. somewhere. There. there it is. Okay. You found it. A lot of gas. A lot of gas. <laughs> we don't drive it much um, for reasons uh, that are pretty obvious. Not necessarily fast. Not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, performance vehicle by any stretch of the imagination. But man, it's damn cool to drive. Take three, trying to move this thing. A lot of gas. Yeah, I should Oh, Jesus. <laughs> okay. say much because I'm spending most of my time making sure I don't hit anything.
god, and right turns are terrifying. I've driven a lot of cars that have obstructions on the hood for whatever prop may be sitting there. This car has a giant box on the hood with time travel equipment. And this thing blocks your entire view. And all I have to look through is about that much. And the truth of, oh God, it sounds like I'm dying. Oh, it's not dying. Oh. <laughs> I can't see where I'm going. Where am I going? Oh, God. Um, and the Shea family, when they first talked to me about this car, they said, it's a bit rickety, it doesn't have second gear. So they filled my head with a little bit of doubt. Nobody knew just how well this car may or may not drive. And there was a good chance that it wouldn't drive. And it's the first time that's really been driven since it's been restored by Brian DeSantos. So, like many times on this program before, we are testing this car for real. Third gear, yeah. Yeah, all right. The pleasant surprise was that this car drives pretty well. It may be missing second gear, but aside from that, and aside from its characteristic bumpiness as a doom buggy, it drives perfectly. Well, kind of. <laughs> That's stall number four. Being a stunt car, they needed no lights, gauges, HVAC, nothing. None of that stuff is functional on this car. It's not roadworthy by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you're able to drive it, you know, in a parking lot or in a field or wherever you want to drive it, uh, or in the desert, of course. What they did was uh, they contracted Conejo Off-Road and they said, this needs to do stunts in the desert. Make it happen. So they literally removed the body from the DeLorean. It'll take me a month to rebuild it. The DeLorean has a backbone. It has a Y in the front and a Y in the back to which the subframe uh, for the front suspension and the fuel tank and all that are in the front. And then the rear, it's the uh, engine and the transaxle and, uh, and the rear suspension. What they did was they literally cut those Ys out and they built a tube frame. Uh, so it's a complete tube chassis like a dune buggy would be. They also took and uh, put Volkswagen suspension and steering and engine and transaxle in this car. So basically it's a Volkswagen underneath the DeLorean from what you see. When I saw the movie and I saw this thing bouncing around the desert, that was one of my favorite scenes. It's, I love seeing cars that don't belong in a certain environment in that environment. But when it comes to DeLoreans, I don't know, this is kind of a great idea. The DeLorean was never a great car. No. So taking what isn't perfect and making it something very, very attractive and interesting by changing it just appealed to me. They built two off-roaders. Uh, the other one, um, rumor has it that it may be in existence still. It may be the one that's uh, at the Universal Studios Back in the Future, the ride in Japan. The part three car was unique, most obviously, by the addition of the hood box. It's much simpler design in the back. It's not nearly as detailed as your A car in part one. That was partially because Kevin Pike's special effects team built those cars to a really, really high standard. Part two and part three were done in-house by Universal. So I don't want to say the quality wasn't as good, but the quality wasn't as good. This car is probably... <laughs> 
how they did any kind of stunts with this thing, I do not know. There were a lot of production dings and dents and things like that. In part three, when Doc and Marty were uh, trying to figure out ways to get the car to go 88 miles an hour, and one of the things they were doing was uh, being pulled by a team of horses. During the, that shot, they felt they were sliding off of the car. Uh, so they lifted the hood up and they put a two by four uh, across the fenders for Michael and uh, Christopher to rest their feet up against. That resulted in some very, very interesting dents in the tops of both front fenders, which are there now. I kind of call it the car that led three lives. Uh, initially, it was the hero car. It was so important on the set. And then after the movie was filmed in 1990, the car was sent to Japan and it did a, a six or nine month tour in Japan. And so it still was greatly loved. Then it was returned to uh, Universal Studios in California and it sort of fell out of love. I mean, it no longer was taken care of and maintained and things began to disappear off it. Things began to deteriorate. And we've actually got pictures of the car uh, with a tree on it. I mean, it really is sad to see what happened to this Hollywood icon. And then around the year 2000, the Peterson Auto Museum in California decided to do a display of uh, Hollywood cars. And George Barris was uh, hired to prepare the car. At that point, the car was rather dilapidated. The, uh, the rear quarter panel has about 30 or 40 drilled holes from where George Barris and his team uh, put this rope lighting and uh, he did what he had to do to make it look presentable. George Barris put those holes in that car. The legend, the builder of the Batmobile, worked on this car. It was returned to Universal Studios, put back on the lot. By this time they had lost the keys, they couldn't get the doors open. It really became a pain in somebody's butt. And so they would de-acquisition pieces. And this is where Desi DeSantos actually saved the car. And his brother spent the next seven or eight years restoring the car. And they paid a lot of attention to detail. They tried their very best to, if not find the parts that were missing, to replicate the parts that were missing. So the car was resurrected it had a new life, it had a rebirth, and that's the way it was presented to us when we saw it for the first time. The efforts done by the DeSantos family to restore this car, we should all be thankful that they actually put the effort into doing it because this way you and I can enjoy touch, interact with an actual screen used car from Back to the Future, one of the best franchises ever made. I, I don't know that he had uh, set out to add any more to the collection. When the opportunity came to buy the Part 3 car, he said, how can we lose? Not that it's not a greed thing or it's not anything like, uh, you know, ego thing. He just, you know, he knew that if he had it, other people would be able to see it. I knew when I bought that, that there'd never be another, that there'd be no other chance to own a car like that. And I knew that we would have it forever, that it'd be something that we would use to bring smiles to people's faces, to share it with people, and to also continue with our goal to raise awareness uh, for uh, Parkinson's. We allow people to have their picture taken uh, right up close uh, to the car. They'd like to make a, a donation to the uh, Fox Foundation. We're glad that we can have fun and at the same time uh, raise awareness and some money for the Fox Foundation. I have no intention whatsoever of ever selling the car. I, I don't see that it's ever going to become a necessity. Let's put it this way. Can you make me an offer I can't refuse? The answer is no. Part one always had the greatest appeal to me. 
part two always had the least appeal to me. Part three, I really do enjoy because it's really a love story. And that part of it appeals to me. The movies themselves are incredibly iconic. This is part of the reason I do what I do. Because name another movie, name another trilogy. Any movie over all time where people will come up to you and they'll recite 10 or 15 quotes from the movie. Or they'll say to you, it was just on the other day I was channel surfing and I saw it on and I stopped and I watched the rest of the movie. So it's a kind of movie that no matter how many times you've seen it, you see it again, you pick up something that you hadn't seen before. Movie cars are very special. They've been selected. The people that make the movies do a lot of thinking beforehand before they select a car. The first time machine was going to be a refrigerator. But then the lawyers spoke up and said, we're going to have all kinds of suits because people are going to be locking themselves in refrigerators. And therein lies the reason the DeLorean is an iconic piece of Hollywood memorabilia and an iconic piece of Americana. The fact that it was a failure, the fact that it was an abject total failure, is a blessing. If that car was a success, if DeLorean had the time to do what he planned to do, the car would have survived, and then it just would have been another car. The British government had lost $150 million and said there will never be another DeLorean built. And as they were throwing the dies in the North Sea, the car was resurrected by the movie. The timing was uncanny, and the timing has made it immortal. The car independently is a star on its own. The movie is a star on its own. But together, they just make for something that's everlasting. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the Back to the Future 3 DeLorean as much as I did. It's my favorite DeLorean, and so this was kind of a dream come true. Thanks to Bill and Patrick for letting me drive your outrageously expensive DeLorean. I feel it's quite an honor to be one of the few people that I have, and it was a hell of an experience. Now, if you like what I'm doing, click that subscribe button, just like everybody else on YouTube. But not only that, click the notifications option, that way you know when a new video comes out and you don't miss a single movie car story. And if you like my shirt, which I do, um, this is original art by Michael Vasquez. Go ahead and check out my merch site, somewhere here, somewhere clickable link here. And uh, get yourself a shirt, wear it around. Show your friends, tell your friends, get them to subscribe too, if that really helps. And uh, if you like my hat, follow me on Instagram and send me a message and I can get you a hat for whatever advertised price is on there currently. Because it's a pretty cool hat, I've heard. Uh, also have patches, different things like that. Go ahead and Send me a message on Instagram, follow me, da-da-da, all the rest. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. I like making documentaries for you guys, so thanks very much.